So if there's ever a hint from anyone uh, begging for money, you let me know and we'll straighten that out. Because this is not about the money. It's about getting out the Word of God. And the reason we're here on an icy day, in which it might have been a little difficult for us to get here, is because the Word of God is very important. It should be the most important thing in our lives. Also, if children should ever grace us with their presence, we have over here on this table some uh, books, and if you'll hold some of them up, uh, by which uh, the guidelines by which to teach the little children doctrine, because we definitely don't want them to have incorrect doctrines when they're being taught. And little children are very perceptive, and we're going to be studying today something called faith perception. And as we begin a basic series, and in fact Matthew's just going to be on hold and we're going to go through basics, and once we're finished with basics, go back to Matthew because we need to get a foundation. Everybody needs a foundation. You don't go to school and start with calculus. You start with addition or subtraction. Therefore, children, as I was saying, ha are very perceptive. They have a lot of faith perception. For example, you can tell a child there's a Santa Claus and they'll believe it immediately. And I have here, I was sent to me, uh, some articles of uh, some of the things children have said in Sunday school, and it's kind of comical. Let's look at this uh, first one here concerning the Good Samaritan. A Sunday school teacher was telling her class the story of the Good Samaritan in which a man was beaten, robbed, and left for dead. She described the situation in vivid detail so her students would catch the drama. Then she asked the class, if you saw a person lying on the roadside, all wounded and bleeding, what would you do? A thoughtful little girl then broke the hushed silence, and she said, I think I'd throw up. <laughs> Another one is concerning Noah. The Sunday school teacher said, Johnny, do you think Noah did a lot of fishing when he was on the ark? Uh, Johnny replied, no, how could he? He only had two worms. <laughs> Here's one concerning uh, a higher power. A Sunday school teacher said to her children, We have been learning how powerful kings and queens were in biblical times, but there is a higher power. Can anyone tell me what it is? One child blurted out, Aces. <laughs> He's going to be a good Texas Hold'em player when he grows up. Here's one in Sunday school. A nine-year-old Joey was asked by his mother what he had learned in Sunday school. Well, Mom, our teacher told us how God sent Moses behind enemy lines on a rescue mission to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. When he got to the Red Sea, he had his engineers build a pontoon bridge, and all the people walked across safely. Then he used his walkie-talkie to radio headquarters for reinforcements. They sent bombers to blow up the bridge, and the Israelites were saved. The mother said, Joey, is that really what your teacher taught you? His mother asked him. He said, no, but if I told you what the teacher said, you'd never believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're beginning uh, some basic doctrines here, and we're going to start out with the doctrine of salvation, which is basic, yet the most important, because this is the way of your salvation. Therefore, we'll take point one, Salvation is by grace through faith in Christ. Salvation is by grace through faith in Christ. Now, I told you earlier, talking about the children, that faith is a system of perception. And that means it is totally devoid of any merit on your part. In other words, you deserve no credit. The object deserves the credit. You see, when you say to yourself... I believe in Christ. The thing that has all the merit is Christ, not us. You believe it's simply faith. I believe that's faith perception. And you believe in Christ. Christ is the object. He's the one who did all the work. So when, you're, when you go to school and you learn that one plus one is two, you accept that by faith as a kindergarten or first grader whenever you learn that one plus one is two. You learn that 
by faith. And there's really no credit on your part. You don't drive around in your car today, have a sticker on the back that says, I'm 32 years old and believe one plus one is two. Big deal. That's uh, no, no credit on your part. You simply accepted by faith one plus one equals two. And by faith, we accept our entire vocabulary. When uh, you're teaching a, a child vocabulary, you say, Johnny, and you point to this little eye. You say, Johnny, this is an eyeball. And then you say, Johnny, what is it? And he says, I. Well, he accepts that by faith. He's not going to argue with you and say, no, Daddy, it's not I. Well, he might, but it would be foolish, you see. No, Daddy, it's not an I, it's a mouth. Well, no, by faith, he accepts this is an eyeball. And by faith, we have accepted the very vocabulary we use, and there's no merit on our part for doing so. All the merit lies in Jesus Christ. The salvation work on, uh, of, of Christ, and this is point two, the salvation work of Christ on the cross excludes anything whatsoever being added to faith. No works of any kind are allowed when it comes to faith alone in Christ alone. Salvation is by grace through faith. And we see in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So what does all this mean? It, of course, means that you can't add anything to faith. When the teacher tells you 1 plus 1 equals 2, you don't say, Teacher, I believe 1 plus 1 equals 2. But I'll only believe that if I do something good. So you want to add good works to it. I have to be a good little boy or a good little girl. And only then can one plus one equal two. Well, we see here the fallacy and the human arrogance. One plus one equals two whether we're good or not. One plus one equals two whether we invite one plus one into our heart. So do you see the foolishness of it? A lot of churches this very day are telling their congregation, you must invite Christ into your heart. First of all, it's not found in Scripture. And secondly, it would be as if you were saying, I invite one plus one into my heart, and that's the only way it will equal two. But one plus one equals two, whether we believe it or not. It equals two, whether we invite it into our heart or not. So the system is faith perception, which means there's no merit on our part. So therefore, like I said, we don't ride around in our cars with a little sticker with a smiley face on it saying, I'm 32 and believe 1 plus 1 equals 2. Big deal. It's not you. It's what Christ did on the cross. And that's the whole point. Therefore, salvation is by grace. And what is grace? There are a lot of churches that have grace in their names. And they say, everyone welcome. This is a grace church. Sure, it's a grace church. If you don't smoke, chew, or go with the girls who do. So, grace is all that God is free to do for unsaved mankind on the basis of the saving work of Christ on the cross. This is point three. Grace is all that God is free to do for unsaved mankind on the basis of the saving work of Christ on the cross. Grace is extended to the human race as unbelievers who are living in spiritual death, total depravity, and total helplessness to do anything about it. So you see, when we are born, we are born into spiritual death. We are called dichotomous. And that's uh, D-I-C-H-O-T-O-U, let's see, dichotomous. We'll get to that in a minute. I got that later. So we have a human soul in a human body at birth. We do not have a human spirit. That makes us dichotomous instead of trichotomous. And that means we are spiritually dead. And what, if you've ever tried to talk to a dead person, you know they cannot respond. So as a spiritually dead person, if you try to invite Christ into your heart, you're dead. Dead people don't invite people anywhere. It's like asking somebody, hey, you want to come to this party? They're dead. You can't invite them. Therefore, we have something called common and efficacious grace, which we will get to shortly. Point four, therefore, as a matter of grace, Salvation is entirely the work of God. It is the work of the Father in judging our sin. It is the work of the Son who was judged for our sin. And it is the work of the Holy Spirit 
in common and efficacious grace. Now this is a basic doctrine, and if you haven't heard this before, then you haven't had a very good pastor because these are very, very basic doctrines, and they're very important, and we should know them. So therefore, as a matter of grace, salvation is entirely the work of God. It is the work of the Father in judging our sins. It is the work of the Son in being judged for our sins, and it is the work of the Holy Spirit in common and efficacious grace. This is why the way of salvation is faith alone in Christ alone, with no works whatsoever added to it. There are three reasons why it is faith plus nothing, absolutely nothing on our part. The first is efficacious grace, and we will get a very comprehensive definition of efficacious grace here shortly. And efficacious grace is documented in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, where it says, It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So the first one that we will note is efficacious grace. The second reason it is faith alone and Christ alone is what our Lord said on the cross. Our Lord, when he was hanging on the cross, he had the nails shoved through his hand. And, of course, his bones were not broken because that was part of prophecy, but it separated his bones when the nails went through. And he uttered not a word as that was going on. The nails were shoved through his hands, both hands and both feet. You might see the Roman Catholics try to tie ropes around his hands. That's not the way it was. He was hanging by them nails, and it was separating with excruciating pain. Yet he said not a word as he was on the cross. Not until our sins were imputed to him and judged did he cry out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he was forsaken for you and for me. He knew why he was forsaken, and he was making that statement so that we would understand the enormity of what had just happened. Our sins, all of our sins, billions upon billions of sins, were imputed to him and judged. And therefore he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he was forsaken for you and for me. And therefore, after this was completed, our Lord said, Tetelestai, and that means it is finished now with results that go on forever. That means the work had been completed. There is nothing absolutely nothing left for us to do because Christ did it all on the cross and it is complete blasphemy to add anything to faith. You are saying Christ did not do enough while he was screaming in agony. Of course he did enough. And all that's left for us to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And point three, we have a direct statement from Scripture. And in fact, there is Scripture after Scripture after scripture that says faith alone in Christ alone with nothing added to it. So today while churches all across this land are preaching salvation plus something that is pure apostasy and it's taking people away from the gospel of Christ. And many are not saved thinking that they are. So let's take a look at the first principle that I noted which was efficacious grace. Efficacious grace, that's E-F-F-I-C-A-C-I-O-U-S. Efficacious grace. Point one under efficacious grace. Efficacious grace fits into the pattern of faith alone. When a spiritually dead person, and, you, and that is everyone at the moment of birth, is spiritually dead. And when a spiritually dead person responds to the divine call or the invitation for eternal salvation, he simply responds by believing in Jesus Christ. This is faith alone plus nothing. When a spiritually dead person simply believes in Christ, God the Holy Spirit causes that faith to be effective for eternal life. So we see here we have two forms of grace two forms, two things that God the Holy Spirit does. First of all, we have common grace. And what is common grace? You see, we are born 
spiritually dead. And a spiritually dead person has no ability whatsoever to come to Christ because he's dead. He can't invite Christ. He can absolutely do nothing. And he's dichotomous, having only a soul and a body. And in fact, he is completely incapable of understanding the gospel. Completely. That's spiritual phenomenon. An unbeliever cannot understand the gospel because he has no human spirit. So what happens in common grace? The unbeliever says, I want to know what this is all about. So God the Holy Spirit acts as the human spirit for the spiritually dead person. He acts as a human spirit. That does not mean the spiritually dead person is yet saved. It means he is sitting down, willing to listen to the gospel. So what happens? God the Holy Spirit acts as a human spirit and teaches, in, uh, teaches the spiritual phenomenon to the spiritually dead person and that is grace because as spiritually dead you would not understand it apart from this function this function of common grace so having only a soul and a body God the Holy Spirit acts as the human spirit so that the unbeliever can understand what is being taught to him and that is called conviction a lot of pastors uh, might say this morning are you convicted well, it's not a conviction of your sin. It is a conviction of knowing finally in your mind what it means that Jesus Christ died on the cross as a substitute for you and that you must believe that. Now, at that point, you can say, no, I will not believe that, or you can say, yes, I will. This common grace does not mean you're about to be saved. But efficacious grace, when you believe in Jesus Christ, efficacious grace is where you believe it. And then in efficacious grace, God the Holy Spirit takes that faith and makes it effective for our salvation. So that's what efficacious grace is. So let's break this down for you uh, in more detail. The faith of the spiritually dead person indicates positive volition. Now positive volition means that you are simply, uh, you look up toward the heavens and you say, God, I want to know you. So the spiritually dead person looks toward the heavens and says, God, if you're there, I want to know you. So this means he has a moment of positive volition, and this means there is no merit on his part. He simply reached God consciousness, which all of us do, who are not morons. If you have an IQ of 72, you're going to have uh, God consciousness at some point. And if you never reach God consciousness, you automatically go to heaven. That's a part of the grace of God. But because the spiritually dead person who believes in Christ is helpless, his faith is ineffective without the ministry of God the Holy Spirit. So efficacious grace causes that faith to be effective for salvation. Any works added to faith in Christ are dead works, and the Holy Spirit does not make dead works effective for salvation. So if you invite Christ into your heart plus believe, God the Holy Spirit in His divine wisdom cannot take that inviting, into, inviting Christ into your heart and make it effective for salvation because that is not the procedure God has set up. And in fact, in, by inviting Christ into your heart, who are you making the subject? You're making yourself the subject, your own human arrogance. Instead of just believing, you want to add something to it. And by doing so, you are not saved. And a lot of people think they are simply by inviting Christ into, into their heart. And they are not, not at all. And it's a tragic thing that's been happening across this land that, they don't, that people don't even understand enough doctrine to understand the simplicity of the gospel message, which is faith alone in Christ alone. Therefore, the omnipotence of the Holy Spirit will make effectual only faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have a sequence to pre-salvation. First of all, we have common grace, which I have here on the board. Common grace is the Holy Spirit makes the gospel message perspicuous. That is, he makes the gospel understandable. And not only to a spiritually dead person, but a spiritual, spiritually dead person is spiritually brain dead. So he is totally incapable of understanding anything whatsoever that you say to him. Point two, God the Father invites. Notice who does the inviting. It is God the Father. 
God the Father invites the spiritually dead person to believe in Christ. And this is called the divine call. So there is a divine call, and that is when God the Father invites the spiritually dead to believe in Christ. Point three, the spiritually dead person believes in Christ, and the Holy Spirit causes this faith to be effective for salvation, and therefore this is called efficacious grace. Again, when any works are added to faith in Christ, the omnipotence of God the Holy Spirit, omnipotence means all-knowing, omnipotence of God the Holy Spirit will not cause that faith to be effective. And the reason is because divine omnipotence and human works or human power are mutually exclusive. Now what does that mean? Well, it means just as freedom and equality are mutually exclusive. Now today a lot of uh, politicians think we can have freedom and equality. Well, it's impossible. Some of us have a greater motivation than others. And in that motivation, under freedom, we take our lives and we work hard and we make money and some of us become wealthy and yet some of us are poor. That's freedom. In freedom, you can't have everybody making the same wages. That cancels out freedom. If everybody made the same wage, it would cancel out freedom because no one would have the freedom to have the initiative to move ahead. So just the same is that freedom is mutually exclusive with uh, security or what would we would call an equality, then also in this, in the divine call, uh, divine omnipotence and human works are totally and mutually exclusive. Consequently, any human work added to faith in Christ cancels faith. For human works is human power, and that is rejected by grace. Therefore, we note again Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, a very important verse. And it, support, it supports salvation by faith alone in Christ alone, which says, For you have been saved by grace through faith, and this salvation is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So I'm not making this up. It's a part of Scripture. Continuing, So salvation is not from ourselves. It is a matter of common grace. It is a matter of the divine call, and it is a matter of efficacious grace. That's why it says it is a gift from God. And when you receive a Christmas, a Christmas gift, you are receiving something that uh, you do not earn or deserve. You simply receive it, open it up, and you're glad for it. And you might say thank you, you might not. It doesn't matter. You've received a gift. And this is what God has done to us. He's given us a gift, something we haven't earned or deserved. So, we have a summary of efficacious grace now. The very nature of real, real spiritual death at birth eliminates any system of salvation by works. The spiritually dead person is incapable of doing anything to obtain salvation. And now we have four points that will include what spiritual death is. What is spiritual death? First of all, it is total depravity. Spiritual death is total depravity. And that means you can be uh, morally degenerate or immorally degenerate. Believe it or not, you might run into a moral person at some point, and you say to yourself, well, this person is not an alcoholic. Actually, he gave up drinking. This person gave up smoking. This person gave up so many uh, things that he used to enjoy, and now he is very moral, and he's a very moral person. Therefore, he must be saved. But if he has not made the choice to believe in Christ, he is not saved. There are Muslims who are moral. There are Jews who are very moral, even more moral than some of us Christians are. But so what? They're in moral degeneration. Now, I'm not encouraging you to go out and be immoral. That's not the point. The point is morality is not a means of salvation. Neither is immorality. There are some people in the more obvious immoral degeneration. That is, they like to go out and raise hell, get drunk, fornicate, whatever. Whatever they do. Uh, the uh, fast crowd, as they're called. People who get into drugs or whatever. Well, if they haven't believed in Christ, then they're in immoral degeneration, and they are totally, totally depraved. So the point one, spiritual death, includes total depravity, and that means you could either be a moral degenerate, as in the Judaizer or the Muslim, or you could be 
the immoral degenerate, as in the person going out every day raising hell. The second point is total separation from God. Spiritual death includes total separation from God. Point three, total helplessness to attain a relationship with God. You see, in religion, people want to attain a relationship with God, so in religion, they base it on what they do. They think they'll get to God by the good works they do or by something that they achieve in life. But you are totally helpless in spiritual death to do anything about it except the one non-meritorious thing, which is faith alone in Christ alone. Point four, the status quo of dichotomy. That's D-I-C-H-O-T-O-M-Y. Now, dichotomy means you have only a soul and a body. You have no human spirit because you have not believed in Christ. The status quo of dichotomy, having only a body and a soul. And without a human spirit, we are unable to understand the simplest concepts of the gospel. We are completely and totally unable to understand anything regarding the gospel. Therefore, the very nature of common grace, the divine call, and efficacious grace eliminate any type of salvation by works. Since the unbeliever is spiritually dead, he is totally separated from God, totally helpless to do anything about it. The spiritually dead person can only produce dead works, which have no validity with God. As Isaiah 64, 6 says, our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in God's sight. And we'll get to the corrected translation of that on another day. In the function of evangelism, there are two acts of human volition. For example, if you were to go to a uh, Billy Graham uh, meeting or somewhere where the gospel might be given, there are two acts of human volition. First of all, you make the choice to go see this man who is about to give the gospel. Therefore, the first choice is you hear the gospel. And that is non-meritorious. All of us here today can hear. Now, there are some people who are deaf, and that's a problem in itself. But all of us can hear. And we hear on the basis of grace. There's no, we don't have a sticker on our car that says, I can hear. Praise me. I can hear. So what? You can hear. It's non-meritorious. So what you do is you go and you listen to the evangelist. And that is hearing the gospel, and that's no merit on your part. And then the second thing you do is believe in Jesus Christ. And there is no merit in that either. Except that God the Holy Spirit will take that faith and make it effective for your salvation. The spiritually dead person is unable to understand what he hears. In other words, when he sits down to hear the gospel, he, was, he is um, incapable in spiritual death to understand the gospel, and he is powerless to make his faith in Christ effective for salvation. Therefore, the ministry of God the Holy Spirit in making the gospel understandable is common grace, which we have up here on the board. God the Father invites him to believe in Christ. Notice who does the inviting. We don't. We're not capable. We're dead. Spiritually dead people can't invite Christ anywhere. Who does the inviting? It's God the Father. He invites us to believe. That's why Scripture says, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Finally, the omnipotence of the Holy Spirit makes his faith in Christ effective for eternal life, which is efficacious grace. The spiritually dead person can listen to the gospel and believe in Christ, but these two decisions come from a position of spiritual death and come from a position of complete powerlessness to provide their own salvation. They are unable to make faith effective for their, their salvation. Therefore, pre-salvation clarification of the gospel is the ministry of God the Holy Spirit. For example, a... Uh, evangelists might not have the gospel down completely right. And the evangelist might get up and give an hour-long speech, and yet the only thing the unbeliever is going to get out of it is believe in Christ and be saved. And that's because God the Holy Spirit, acting as a human spirit, will take all the garbage that is spewing out of the evangelist's mouth, whether it be inviting Christ into your heart, whether it be any works that he adds to it, if, in fact, at any point he says you must believe in Christ to be saved, that is the one thing God the Holy Spirit will pick up on and send to the unbeliever's soul. 
Therefore, the unbeliever can understand that it's faith alone in Christ alone, even if the evangelist isn't teaching it correctly. So a lot of times, people can be saved at evangelistic meetings where the gospel is not being given very clearly because God the Holy Spirit, in grace, will make it clear and, in other words, takes up the slack for our stupidity. This is done when we believe simply believe in Christ. And then when we do simply believe in Christ, God the Holy Spirit makes that effective for our salvation. And now we're going to note something that is widespread today, and that is that salvation is not by works. Many pastors today say that salvation is by works. Uh, yes, you believe in Christ, but you must do this, stop this, and do this, and do good works, and uh, a lot of other things. So we're going to take a look at some of the works that they say are needed for salvation. The, verse, the first type is called verbal works. Verbal works. So a pastor might uh, tell you, well, yes, you believe in Christ, but you're not saved yet. You have to repent. Now, what does repent mean? Now, we took a look at this next week. A lot of us weren't here, so we'll take a look at it again. Repent. And if you have a King James Bible, you definitely have repent all through there. What does repent even mean, though? Uh, most people will say, well, that means feel sorry for your sin. But that is not the case. In the Greek we have the word meta noieo and that's transliterated M E T A N O I E O meta noieo and that means to change your mind now some translations I believe the NIV actually says change your mind. They actually get it right. So in one case, uh, repentance is used as metanoieo, which means to have a change of mind. So when it says repent and believe in Christ, does that mean feel sorry for your sins and believe in Christ? Absolutely not. It means to change your mind about Christ. You see, in spiritual death, everything you learn about Christ in spiritual death is foolishness. You can't understand it. The idea of somebody dying on the cross as a substitute for you is absolute foolishness. And not until God the Holy Spirit makes that perspicuous, which means understandable, in your soul you will always think of it as foolishness. So when God the Holy Spirit suddenly convicts you and shows you that it's faith alone in Christ alone, suddenly you have a change of mind, metanoia-o. That's repent. You repented. Now, repent is an old English word. You don't say, today I was going to go to the grocery store, but it was snowing so hard I repented. We don't say that. We say, I changed my mind. And that's what it means. Metanoieo means change your mind. Now, there is also another Greek word used in the case of Judas Iscariot, and he did not metanoieo. He metamelomide. And that is also translated repent, sadly enough. Metamelomine is translated in or uh, M E T A M E L O M A I. Metamelomine. Now, in this case, even though it's translated repent, it has a meaning of regret or some type of guilt reaction. Now, Judas Iscariot had a guilt reaction when he betrayed Christ, but that did not save him. In fact, Esau wept for salvation but he did not receive it, as you find in Hebrews. So, the only way of salvation is to believe in Christ, and metanoia is simply saying, it's simply recognizing the common grace of the Holy Spirit. That's all metanoia is doing, because when the Holy Spirit reveals to you that it's faith alone in Christ alone, you change your mind, and that's a part of what we have all done. We have changed our minds as a result of the common grace of God and the Holy Spirit. So there is nothing to repentance except a simple change of mind concerning Christ. 
so that's one way that, that uh, is uh, commonly misunderstood, is that we have to repent for our, our salvation. And in fact, repentance is just the process by which you believe, and we all go through that. And it's no merit on our part. And we don't have to weep tears of repentance at an altar. The only thing we have to do is believe. Now, weeping tears of repentance at an altar, who gets the attention then? You do. You're the one trying to get the attention, saying, look, I wept so hard. God had mercy on me and saved me. Big deal you weep. We all weep. It's simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we have another way by which people have been led astray, and that is invitation. Now invitation actually has a right and a wrong connotation. The right invitation is made by our Lord. He invites us to salvation. The invitation to salvation follows the principle of coming to Christ, not inviting Christ to come to you. By believing in Christ, we come to Christ at His invitation. That's found in Matthew 11:28, where it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. These words were uttered by our Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't say, invite me. He said, come unto me. He's inviting you. John 6.35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. So note that Jesus Christ invites us to, to salvation. We do not invite him. John 6.37, the one that comes unto me, I will certainly not cast, cast out. John 6:47 He who believes in me has eternal life. This is our Lord's invitation to the spiritually dead. We are spiritually dead as of the moment of our birth. We cannot invite Christ anywhere. He can only invite us, which he has done through common grace. This becomes efficacious grace when we believe in Jesus Christ. And as I said before, dead people do not issue invitations. It's impossible. The spiritually now, if you talk to dead people and dead people respond to you, I recommend you see a psychiatrist. And I'm not being facetious and funny about it. I'm you would be surprised how many people think the dead have come and spoken to them. It's unreal. So if that's happening to you, you will not understand what I'm trying to say here. That dead people can't make an invitation. They're dead. They've moved on. They're gone. So we can't make an invitation in spiritual death. The spiritually dead person can hear and believe, but this is only because God the Holy Spirit in grace, in common grace, and in efficacious grace has made this possible. And we have the wrong invitation made in two categories. The first is a pastor will tell you, well, just invite Christ into your heart. Or a pastor will tell you, invite Christ into your life. The pastor that says invite Christ into your life is realized that uh, inviting them into your heart is never found, so they try to get around it. So we have come up with two categories, inviting Christ into your heart and inviting Christ into your life. The reason these blasphemous ideas have been made is found in one verse, and that's Revelation 3:19 through 20. And you might want to turn to that verse, Revelation 3:19 through 20, as this verse has been a, a source by which Many pastors have messed up in regards to the invitation. And they think that uh, Revelation 3:19 through 20 is written to the unbeliever. Revelation 3:19 through 20 is addressed to those who have already believed in Christ. They've already made the decision to believe. And therefore, what does it mean? You see, a lot of pastors think that every verse in the Bible was written for our salvation. Well, there's a spiritual life after we're saved, and there's stuff we have to do after we're saved. So it's foolishness to think that every verse you come across has to do with salvation. And that's what they do in Revelation here, where it says, Those whom I love, I reprimand. Now, who does God love? God loves personally the believer. He does not love personally the unbeliever. God loves impersonally the unbeliever, but he, do, he loves personally, and this is phileo. That means a personal love. 
In the Greek, this love, those whom I love, phileo, is a personal love. So therefore, it is addressed to believers only. Those whom I love, I reprimand. And that means divine discipline. As believers in Christ, when we get out of line, God punishes us. When we don't put Bible doctrine as number one in our life, God will punish us. Therefore, it says, be zealous, and here's that word again, repent. Be zealous and repent. Now, in this case, it's not talking about salvation, and it is this word, metamelomai, or metanoieo, excuse me, in the Greek. This means to have a change of mind, not about Christ. You're having a change of mind, in this case, about your sin. You finally wake up and realize you have been in sin, you are out of fellowship, in carnality, so therefore, you utilize 1 John 1, 9 as a believer and name your sins to God, and you are forgiven, and therefore the punishment is put on hold. Behold, I stand at the door and keep knocking. That is warning discipline. You did not respond to the first type of discipline, so the discipline gets harder. He keeps knocking, trying to get you back into fellowship. If anyone hears my voice, that means finally you have a motivation to rebound, to utilize 1 John 1, 9, to name your sins to God so that the discipline may stop. And he opens the door, that is through rebound. You open the door. This is the function of rebound. I will enter and in face to face with him. Now face to face means a restoration of fellowship. And I will dine with him. Now when we go out to eat, usually we go out to eat and say this is part of fellowship. Well this is what is being conveyed, conveyed here. This is fellowship between the father and his children. It is fellowship of the Christian way of life. It has nothing whatsoever to do with salvation. We are not saved by inviting Christ anywhere. The only time we can dine with Christ is as believers in Christ in fellowship. So this is the misunderstanding of the fact that there is a fellowship with God beyond just salvation. And then it goes on to say, and he with me, and this means Operation Z, which we haven't studied yet, and we will get to, that is the pastor teaching to the congregation with an emphasis on the Word of God. So, let's take some points. When Jesus Christ, in this verse, stands at the door and knocks, he is extending to us, as believers in Christ, an invitation to utilize 1 John 1.9 which states, if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to purify us from all wrongdoing. Note that it does not state, if we feel sorry for our sins. No, nope, that's not part of it. It's simply name. That is homo legeo in the Greek, 5th century B.C., and it means to name or cite your sin as you would in a courtroom. You would cite your sin and, or, or cite your crime and say, I have done this and so. So when you utilize 1 John 1, 9, you say, I've done thus and so, Father, and therefore you are forgiven, not because of your feeling sorry, but because of the faithfulness of God, not because of anything you have done. So this is not a salvation verse. This refers to a post-salvation experience, which we will call rebound. The wrong invitation is blasphemous, because this becomes salvation by works. It adds something to faith in Christ. The wrong invitation is defined as inviting Jesus Christ to come to you. However, in salvation we go to Christ through believing in him as per his call and his invitation. There is no salvation by inviting Christ to come to us. The wrong invitation is divided into two general categories which are practiced today, which we just noted, and that is inviting Christ into your heart or inviting Christ to come into our lives. The, uh, the public acknowledgement, now we're going on to something else before we wrap up the first uh, message today. There is a public acknowledgement. Now a lot of pastors will say, okay, don't invite Christ in your heart. Don't invite him into your life. But uh, what you must do is publicly acknowledge with your mouth that Christ is the Lord. Now this is wrong. What if you're mute? What if you can't speak and you never get to do that public acknowledgement? Are you denied salvation? Absolutely not. A public, look, I acknowledge with my mouth Jesus Christ is Lord. Big deal, I'm already saved. 
I've already accepted that. In the case of Romans 10, 9 through 10, which is used as a salvation passage many times, it says to acknowledge with your mouth Jesus Christ is Lord. That is a post-salvation experience. I can only acknowledge that because I have at one point simply believed it in the past. In the past I believed in Christ, so now I can say with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Savior. That does not mean that if you are not saved you have to get up in front of a bunch of people, uh, sacrifice your privacy, and say, I have believed in Christ. You can do that in your own soul. And you can do that without having to be embarrassed by getting up in front of people. That has nothing to do with your salvation. What if you're a paraplegic and you can't walk to the front? What if uh, you can't speak? It has nothing to do with our human energy. Do you get the drift? What we do with our mouth, that's a human energy. That's a human type of activity. By grace, I can speak with my mouth, but I could lose my voice at any moment. And then what? So what this has to do with is simply believing in Christ in your mind and public acknowledgement is a result of it. And as a result of my spiritual life, I can tell you Jesus Christ is Lord. But I wasn't saved because I'm telling you that. I was saved at five years old because when I was five years old, I told God the Father I was going to believe in Christ. And that was the moment of my salvation. So therefore, understand that public acknowledgement is not part of it. And therefore, we will continue with uh, other means by way uh, people say salvation such as commitment or making Christ Lord and other false doctrines that have came up but now we will have a break and uh, get some coffee or whatever you need to do so with your heads bowed and your eyes closed Father we thank you for this opportunity to learn these basic doctrines and while we are studying, studying the basic doctrine of salvation we understand it is the most important doctrine for it is the basis of our own spiritual life after salvation therefore may we understand this grace may we understand that Jesus Christ did it all on the cross and there is nothing left for us to do except believe in Christ's name we ask it amen <laughs>